Well, hello and a warm welcome to Ask the Leader, the last in our series. We're putting the leaders of the SNP, the Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats on the spot all throughout this week. They've all been facing questions from a live studio audience here in Glasgow and I've been trying to press them for the answers. If you'd like to join tonight's debate on social media, the hashtag is Ask the Leader. Now, you may know we've already heard this week from Willie Rennie, Kezia Dugdale and Ruth Davidson. Tonight, it's the turn of the First Minister and Scottish National Party leader, Nicola Sturgeon. And the first question for her comes from Sheila Farnsworth. Sheila. Hi, thank you. Hi. Why do you want Scotland to become independent from the UK, with which it's geographically linked, only to become dependent on the EU? Is that a fair summary of your response to Brexit? Um, I believe Scotland should be independent, not because we should be separate from the rest of the United Kingdom, but that we should be uh, on an equal footing to England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We should be in a partnership of equals. The, Scotland will always be part of the, the British Isles, but I think we should have responsibility for the direction of our country. In terms of the second part of your question, which is a very good question, and it's one that I get asked often, why do you want to be independent and part of the European Union? And the fact of the matter is... It, it, and I think when we think about this, we can you know, see, see this very clearly. The European Union is an organisation made up of independent countries. So France and Germany, Spain, Portugal, they're all independent countries, but they come together to cooperate on issues that in the modern world, no individual country can tackle on its own. And a very topical example, I suppose, of one of those issues is climate change. You know, no country these days, uh, despite what President Trump appears to think, can tackle climate change on its own. So on that and, you know, the other aspect of the European Union is the single trading market. We have uh, a market in the single market that's eight times the size of our UK market. Okay. So we've got many more customers to sell our goods to. And I think Scotland and indeed the, the UK should be part of that, cooperating, but cooperating on the basis of being an independent country. OK, I want to talk more about your approach to Brexit in a moment, sure. but I'll, I'll come back to Sheila and perhaps others in, in the audience. What's your own view? Uh, well, I definitely don't want Scotland to become independent. However, I do want to stay in the EU as well. So. But as part of the UK. Yeah. In, yes, in the UK. yes. And gentleman in the, the back row with the yellowy tie. Hi there. Um, I can see why you'd want to leave uh, Britain, obviously. But what exactly gives you the mandate for us to have another referendum? I mean, we voted on it previously... And we voted on Europe last year, and the question wasn't, do you want Scotland to leave Britain? Mm -hmm. Again, very good and fair questions to me, and you know, this gives me the opportunity to set out the answer, I hope, clearly. Um, we, we fought, and uh, you, you'll recall this because it is only a year ago, we fought an election to the Scottish Parliament. That was just before the European uh, referendum. And the manifesto that I uh, fought that election on last year said that if we had a scenario, which I hoped didn't arise, uh, where Scotland voted to stay in the EU, but the rest of the UK voted to leave, and Scotland faced being taken out against our will, I thought in those circumstances, Scotland should have a choice about its future. Now, that scenario arose. The SNP won that election. Now, my position on Brexit and a choice for Scotland is that I don't think we should... Uh, face that choice now but at the end of the Brexit process when we know what that deal looks like when we know what the implications are I think Scotland should have a choice about its future okay, because at this, at this election you are <coughs> proposing or you've resurrected mm. the idea of some kind of compromise deal where the UK or Scotland would be allowed to stay in the single well, market in those circumstances you say you would accept Brexit uh, why have you resurrected that plan? Well, I think it comes directly to Sheila's point here because I'm very aware of the fact that there are many people in Scotland uh, who don't want independence but who don't want to leave the European Union either. Uh, I'm also very aware of the fact that the UK is made up of four nations. Two of them voted to stay in the EU and two of them voted to leave. So in the immediate aftermath of the EU referendum, I thought it was quite important to try to find some compromised ground. And the Scottish Government published a, a paper in December last year that said, OK, we accept reluctantly that we leave in the EU, but let's try and find a way of staying in the single market. Because leaving the single market for Scotland will put tens of thousands of jobs on the line. OK, but that proposal <coughs> was rejected sure. by the UK Government, and at that point you said that was why we had to have and another independence <laughs> referendum. So why I, I, resurrect well, the idea Theresa May now? called an election. She, she refused to... 
uh, countenance those proposals. She refused to give them any serious consideration, which I think was regrettable. But then she called an election. I think she might be regretting it now, but she called uh, an election, which gives me the opportunity to say to people uh, like Sheila and others, OK, you don't support independence, but back the SNP to strengthen our hand to try to get a compromise and get Scotland's voice heard in these negotiations. OK, so if Theresa May was still Prime Minister mm. after this mm. election, let's imagine for some reason she has a change of mind and decides to go down the route of keeping Scotland in the, the single market. Would, in those circumstances, you take in independence and the is, referendum off the table? What, what I've said is I think at the end of this process, Scotland should have a choice. But my job in trying to persuade uh, people in Scotland to vote for independence, I guess, would be more difficult if we'd found a compromise that kept Scotland in the single so market. So would you take it off, off the table? I mean, no, previously I, I you said if she, if she went down this route with you, you would I, I think it's important. And, uh, this, uh, and I would say this to people even who, who oppose independence and would vote against independence in this scenario. At the end of this process, because none of us know what the outcome of the Brexit process is going to be. We heard Theresa May, I think earlier this week, herself talk about how disastrous it will be for jobs and public finances if it goes wrong. Now, if I was to say... Scotland shouldn't get a choice. That would be me deciding single-handedly what Scotland's future should I know, but be. But why and I would think Theresa May agree to what you call a compromise if because, you're not going to change your position because on independence? Because I guess she might think if she came up with a compromise that kept Scotland in the single market, she'd have more chance saying to people in Scotland you shouldn't uh, support independence. So I think we should have a choice. But I've always wanted to try to find that compromise ground because, and Sheila's a good example of this, there are many people out there who don't agree with me on independence but do agree with me on the European Union. And I'm conscious okay. of the fact that although I support independence, I'm first minister of the country and I have got a duty to try to find ground that brings as many people together as possible. Okay. Let me um, bring in a couple of voices from the audience, uh, the lady in the front row and then the, the gentleman with the striped shirt in the back. Hi, First Minister. I, you were talking about bringing Scotland together as a country and you wanting to end up having another independence referendum. But what I don't understand is that for 10 years SNP has been in power, but we still have, in 2017, we still got poverty in parts of Glasgow. When my dad was mm -hmm. in Easter House, when he was younger, there's still poverty there. We've, still, we've got a high uh, deficit rate. We have lack of funding for NHS, NHS services, for charity services, for policing. The education system is an absolute abomination really there's people leaving school now that are don't ha are, are in the illiterate as I, and you're saying that in you come across as if independence is going to fix all that why can't after the 10 years you fix those problems now and then look to independence i'm not totally against it the negativity that surrounds brexit is all over the place but somehow if, if brexit ended up having a good outcome for scotland would you then take independence off the table? I, I, my job would be more difficult because I've, you know, it's often said to me, we, we had the independence referendum in 2014, why are you uh, bringing this forward so soon? And the truth is, without Brexit, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this so soon after the last one. So if Brexit, and you know, don't get me wrong, I, I hope Brexit's not a disaster. I don't want to leave the EU, but now that the UK as a whole has voted for that, I really hope that uh, a deal is struck that, isn't disastrous, but I can't suspend my critical faculties. I, I think there is a real <laughs> risk that the outcome of this will be very difficult okay, for us. Answer to the other point. Yes, sorry. I, I don't uh, sit here and say to you that independence is a magic solution to everything, uh, nor do I say that supporting independence uh, lets me and my government off the hook in terms of the, the issues you raise. We've got challenges in Scotland, like every other country, but in many of... Just take a couple of the points you, you made there. Take, take policing, for example, that's been obviously very topical in the, with the tragic events of the last couple of weeks. In Scotland, we've not had uh, reductions in frontline police officers. In England, we've seen 20,000 police officers. Some are now officers proposed, though, aren't they? Uh, well, the police are looking ahead to the changing nature of, of crime with cybercrime, but we've maintained uh, police numbers. On education, I've been very frank that we have challenges in education. Okay. And we might but get more to some people, of those in, of in, course, in a little while. Um, we've been talking about the Constitution, Brexit and independence. A follow-up question from Ali Salik. Ali. Good evening, First Minister. Uh, my question to you is that we, would we definitely be having another Scottish independence referendum in the timescales you proposed? The timescale you proposed. And also what would happen 
if the if say the next UK Prime Minister says no to the request, okay. regardless of the outcome of the general election. So, how would you ensure that the that uh, that the voice of the Scottish Parliament uh, prevails? Okay. So the timescale, just mm-hmm. remind people that you sure. proposed is the autumn of next year through to the spring of 2019? The the reason for that particular timescale is that that is when, right now, the Prime Minister is saying the Brexit process will end. She says, lots of people are sceptical about this, but she says the deal, not just about the divorce from the EU, but the future relationship will be clear before the UK leaves in the spring of 2019. You've been the, suggesting in, in recent well, days, have you not, that you might need to be more flexible, you the, might need to be prepared to wait. I, I can't remember if you were there the day I set out this time scale, but I said that then, because the point of principle for me is not a, an arbitrary date in the calendar. The point of principle is at the end of the process. When's that? It, I, I can't answer that question just now, because I'm not in charge of the Brexit process. OK, but the Conservatives might say that it was years down the when, line, because when they sorry, talk about that... Sorry, I misunderstood your question. You said when, when the terms of the deal... Are known when people can look at the Brexit deal and understand what it means for the country. Your opponents would say the whole thing needs to play out. Well, and bed my in opponents and would say, I think down, Ruth down Davidson said years. 35 years time or something. When, when people informed choice is important. So I'm, I'm not saying now. I'm not saying before people have that choice. Okay. So in terms of that process, when is the absolute latest that you are when, prepared to accept as a, as a time? When scale? people know the terms. Of the deal. So now, is that any later than the spring of 2019? Well, if, if that was going to be later than then, then as I think I said on the day, we would have to factor that in because that's the point of principle at the end of the process when people can see the terms of what they'd be voting and on. And what if the UK government does keep saying no? Because this isn't really up well, to you, is it? You're like, wanting think, them to give you the power and they don't mm-hmm. want to give it. If they say no, that's it then, isn't this, it? This, I think, comes down to a point of democratic principle as well. I mean, I'm very aware that lots of people passionately oppose independence and I respect that although I disagree with it many other people passionately support independence but surely one point of agreement you know, again trying to find the common ground is that whatever Scotland's future turns out to be it should be decided here in Scotland by the Scottish people not dictated uh, by a a Westminster Prime Minister, whoever that Prime Minister happens to be. Okay, and I think if, that's if, the important um, point of principle. If this standoff continues, you were going well, to tell us your next move <laughs> in a statement to Parliament after the Easter break. What's happened to that? Well, then Theresa May called an election and I've, I've been rather preoccupied fighting Yeah, but isn't that the, the perfect election? time to share with people what but, you well, will do no, because I think if the UK government... It, isn't it important no? to let people have their say? So Theresa May says no and I, you know, I'm not saying no... When you listen carefully to what Theresa May and I are saying, actually, there's not a huge difference there. She's saying, not now. I'm saying, not now, but when the process is there. But, okay, you know, but people have the opportunity... Are we entitled to know what you will do if, if the answer Well, the first thing I'll do, I'll, I'll you know, reflect on the result of the election. You know, let people have their say. We've got an election in less than a week's time now. Okay, might Jeremy Corbyn do a deal with you? Um, well, I still... Despite the narrowing of the polls, and the polls are narrowing uh, south of the border, um, I still think the... Chances are Theresa May and the Tories will win this election. I don't like that prospect, but I think it is the case. But what we now have the prospect of in Scotland, uh, I think, is keeping the Tories in check. Because whether or not she increases her majority could be down to the outcome in Scotland. So if we don't want to have a bigger majority, we shouldn't vote Tory. Well, listen, that uh, leads me neatly to our next question, which has been uh, submitted from home by Elshan Fatahani. And Elshan says, why does the SNP claim that it will stand up for Scotland at Westminster, but they won't stand up for education in Holyrood with falling literacy and numeracy rates? We'll come to the education part of that in in a moment but in terms of your role at Westminster Mm -hmm. I mean even if you had all 59 seats in Scotland uh, what can you actually achieve because you're not aspiring to be in government No but I think even the SNP's harshest critic would probably concede that over the past two years we've not been the official opposition in the House of Commons but we've been the effective opposition while Labour have torn themselves apart it's been Angus Robertson week after week after week who has you know, pinned the Prime Minister down at Prime Minister's questions. It's been SNP MPs, you know, taking up a whole range of issues from 
you know, Alison Hewless on the rape clause and the two child tax credit policy, uh, through to Mary Black on uh, fighting the case for WASPy women. It was Stuart Hosey that first picked up on the national insurance increase in the Chancellor's budget, which then forced a, a U turn on that policy. So, well, well, as I understand it, uh, Theresa May U turned on that when she realised her own Theresa backbenches. Theresa U turns on most things, as, as far as I can see. Um, I mean, in terms of the bigger picture, I mean, these are issues you've, you've certainly raised, and I don't, don't deny that, but you stand at this election. Uh, on an anti-austerity ticket you stood two years ago to try and end austerity. Well, How did that go? Well, you know, you're, you're getting kind of quite close here to, and I know you're only putting questions to me, but if we accept the fact that Scotland can't make any difference at Westminster, then, you know, that raises some pretty fundamental questions. I think we can but make a big... you don't accept that. Uh, you, I can, think, you can make a difference think, in the current system. I think we can make a difference. I think we have made a difference. And, you know, if you have... Conservative MPs from Scotland, they will, you know, be rubber stamps for whatever Theresa May wants to do. SNP MPs will stand up for Scotland and fight Scotland's corner. Yeah, That's the difference. I'm trying to get to what you can actually achieve. I mean, two years ago, here's something else that you were keen on at that time. Let's take a look. We will seek agreement that the Scottish Parliament should move to full financial responsibility. And as part of a phased transition, we will prioritise early devolution of powers over employment policy, including the minimum wage, welfare, business taxes, national insurance and equality policy. The powers we need here in Scotland to create jobs, grow revenues and lift our people out of poverty. You haven't achieved any of that, have you? But we're currently in the process of setting up a Scottish social security But those were powers agency. that were promised after well, the referendum in 2014, not since your we, we, uh, landslide we, we, in 2015. We continue to argue for these and you know what is well, what have you actually done to, to seek that package of powers over the last two years we, we've had uh, we, we regularly press for power so the compromise uh, proposals that I talked about around Brexit put forward a whole range of powers uh, including immigration and many of the things in there that we think should be devolved uh, because that actually further devolution would make it more possible for Scotland to protect its interests in the Brexit scenario okay we'll take a couple of uh, points from members of the audience a lady in the, in the back thank you First Minister, um, you talk about the devolution of benefits. So some of the benefits include DLA and, yeah. and PIP, and disability um, living, living allowance, allowance and the personal independence payment. payment. Uh, my husband and I went through a horrific process last year, um, transferring to that benefit. Um, and I know many families, we didn't lose out, we were lucky. Um, but other families are losing out. And the longer that you delay taking on the competence for mm -hmm. these powers, the more families are losing out. People are losing finances, they're losing income, they're losing motability cars, they're, they're the means of getting out and about. So my question to you is, you know, how long are you going to delay this? And, and how do we make sure the families who have lost out mm -hmm. are supported better than they are just now? Well, firstly, uh, we're not delaying delivering this. We have to, we, we're going to take on responsibility for making more payments to individuals in Scotland in one week than the Scottish Government is currently responsible for making in an entire year. Payments to about 4 million people when you take all of the different uh, benefits involved. So we have to be sure we can make those payments reliably so that people who rely on these benefits get the money that they're entitled to. So we're creating right now what will become the biggest public sector agency that's ever been created in Scotland since the Scottish Parliament was established. Now, I would love to say that we can do that overnight, but we can't. We've got to make sure that's done properly. And it's not going to be like the farm payments IT system, is it? Well, the reason we've got to take time to do this properly is so that we can make sure that there is no question at all that people get the payments that they're entitled to. It's interesting because... But, I well, mean, can I finish this point, Glenn? Because, you know... Uh, Angela Constance, the Cabinet Secretary responsible here, made a statement in Parliament just this week about this, where she started to lay out the first benefits that will be paid through the new agency. So carers' allowance, increasing that uh, to the rate of uh, job seekers' allowance is one of the first things we'll do. The new early years benefit to try to help tackle child poverty. But and some of the new powers you know, won't be in place till, what, the end of, of this it, parliamentary we, term at Holyrood? It, it, it was always going to be an implementation over the course of this parliament. But we also, well, two, two further things uh, I would say here. As, as you know, we are building into this agency and this whole approach to benefits a humane uh, system because one of the things I loathe about the current system, and you've got direct experience of it, is how it stigmatises people okay. who are reliant on benefits and almost treats them like criminals. We want to have dignity at the heart right. of the well, system. I'm going to let the question come in very briefly, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to move on to another question. I, I absolutely take that on board and I understand how complex it is from someone who's part of the yeah. system. I, I think 
for me, the issue remains that whilst this is happening and while we set up the infrastructure for this, is that families are becoming destitute, um, that carers will lose carers' allowance because they're losing PIP. And so ultimately, you know, what transfers to Scotland could be a lot less because people have actually lost out. So we're in a situation where families are struggling. Okay, and, yeah, and I know that. Mm -hmm. Which is why we've done... Very much. And I really do need to, I to, to, to move on. OK. Um, the second part of the, the question that we raised a short time ago was about education mm -hmm. and falling literacy and numeracy standards. I know you don't deny that there are problems. Mm -hmm. The question is why... We've, over the past few years, we've introduced a new curriculum, the, the Curriculum for Excellence, which the OECD, the international organisation that often looks at these things, has said is the right thing to do. But we've recognised that there are perhaps part of that curriculum where we need a greater focus. Literacy and numeracy is, is one of those. But you've been in power for 10 and, years. And we've introduced that curriculum. We've been in power for 10 years and there is a lot of improvement in Scottish education. So there are yes, more... literacy and numeracy well, standards me, uh, are slipping uh, in the international well, but, rankings. But, but let me also say there are more young people who leave uh, school these days with qualifications. The gap between the richest and the poorest young people has almost halved in the 10 years we've okay, been in power. In there are more young years, people going to university. Some young people have had their entire school career under the SNP, and at the end of that, standards are going backwards in numeracy and literacy. I, you know, if you, if you take the, the PISA study that's often quoted here... That's the international um, study, yeah. Absolutely, there are challenges in that. The other survey that we published and published recently, uh, if you take second-year uh, pupils, it tests and assesses those pupils against the standards that they're meant to meet, not in second year, but in third year. We've got other data that shows by the time young people are in third year, more than 80% of them are meeting those standards. So, you know, we are making progress and there are improvements, but, yeah, but I'm... But after I'm, 10 years, I mean, if you lot were really good at this, standards would be well, I increasing think in, in year many, on year. In many areas of our education system, that is the case. You've got more young people leaving school with good qualifications. You've but got more young you people going on a, on a to You're now embarking on a programme of what your education Secretary because, says is radical reform. Because, Shouldn't that have happened years ago? Because well, we've introduced a new curriculum, uh, which took a, a number of years to do. But I do believe in, in politics, and sometimes you know this is, is not the, the standard approach. Where you have challenges, be honest about those challenges. So we have embarked on a programme through our national improvement framework, through our attainment challenge. So head teachers right now have got additional resources directly in their own hands to try to do more to tackle these okay, issues. Lots of, lots of hands up. Um, lady on this side in the orange jacket and then yeah. the lady on the other side in, in the white. Hi, um, I, I am a teacher. I just actually recently retired after 37 years in teaching, teaching maths. And over the last 10 years, I'll tell you why you have got, went down. First of all, you, we had a system at the beginning of 2000, 2006, where class sizes for maths and English in S1 and S2 were at 20, and it was great. We, we actually saw an increase in the pizza results at that point. Um, we were able to deal with children who had individualised needs. A couple of years later, SNP came into power, and the authority I worked with um, became SNP as well. The first thing they did was they increased class sizes. We went from 20 average S1 and S2 to 33. Our neighbouring authority, they remained at 20. And by the way, they're always up there in the Can top Can you say which part of the, the country this was? I was in Renfrewshire. Okay, um, and uh, next door was East Renfrewshire, who, because think, my, that, my family is, worked there... Do you think class size is, is, is a relevant factor in totally terms of overall relevant, performance? Totally relevant. The SNP council in Renfrewshire at that time increased, decreased the number of teachers. They um, took away our support in classrooms, classroom assistance. So how do you think we were what, what, decimated what, what, compared to East Renfrewshire. Marks out of ten, then? Oh, they were two out of ten. OK. I'll and look, and uh, children... Uh, Another point, and then I'll, I'll bring Nicola Surgeon back. I speak as a head teacher over the last 10 years <clears throat> since you came into power. Every single year, there's been cuts in budgets, there's been cuts in staffing, there's been cuts in every service that supports us in education. And obviously, austerity is, you know, that's been part of it. I accept that. Um, but you can't expect that children will make the same level of attainment yeah. if you don't fund them. And certainly, class sizes is the main thing. But I think that 
teachers and head teachers are not consulted directly mm -hmm. enough. I think most recently what has happened with the Pupil Equity Fund and the National Improvement Framework, yes, there are things happening now, but we've had 10 years of this. And in this 10 years, children have lost opportunities. And I think that's been a really sad business that here we are today with such a loss of attainment for our young people. Okay, first minister. I'm, I'm sitting here listening to a, a former teacher, and I, I think you said a current head teacher. So I'm, I'm not going to sit here and argue with your experience. I've got to listen to that experience. And my job is to respond to that and make sure that if there are things we've not got right, we get them right now. You mentioned the Pupil Equity Fund. That is a, a, a very deliberate, targeted initiative to get the resources into the hands, not of councils, uh, but of head teachers directly. Um, I spoke to a head teacher in uh, Eastern Bartonshire at the weekend who told me he thought that was the most transformational thing that had happened in his time as a head teacher. Uh, we certainly should and must consult with uh, those in the teaching profession because you're at the front line of this. I'm, you know, I, I'm absolutely, there is nothing uh, that we will talk about tonight that I'm more determined to make sure we do than tackle some of the challenges we've got. Okay. I, on behalf of pupils and teachers all over the country, I, I don't think we should sit here and say everything in Scottish education is dreadful because the evidence does not bear okay. that out. One... But where there are challenges, we must address Okay, them. I want to ask one... The fund to help these schools they can't use it to get teachers because there are no teachers out there yeah. and you're reducing the opportunity to train more yeah. teachers next yeah. year's going to be 700 less teachers yeah. I can't understand we're, that because you've already accepted that there's not enough teachers We're, we're, we're increasing the number of uh, students going into teachers, so this year there's 371 I think it is, additional uh, places at teacher training we've increased places at teacher training uh, courses every year now for the last six years and we'll continue to do that Teacher recruitment challenges are, are not unique to Scotland. They're a, almost a, a global challenge right now. We're also, the General Teaching Council is looking at potential different routes into teaching so that we might be able to attract uh, different kinds, getting okay. perhaps retired teachers well, let me ask back you a, into a quick follow -up the classroom. On, on that. From, from the way you're looking at me there, I don't think you're, you're up for that challenge. <laughs> let me ask you a quick follow-up, because it's reported today in the Times Educational Supplement yeah. that uh, the government in Scotland is prepared to uh, let organisations like Teach First mm -hmm. apply for contracts to fast-track people into the system, bypassing the, the normal routes. Is that correct? Well, People would have to have a teaching qualification, but we are uh, about to go out to tender because we've got to do that for uh, a, an additional different route into teaching and Teach First, with other organisations, would be able to apply for that. OK, I'm going to squeeze in one final mm -hmm. question. I'm sorry for those who wanted to come in on, on education. Uh, last one from uh, our contributor, Stephen Young. Good evening, First Minister. Would a small tax rise be something you would consider if the money was ring-fenced and put into the NHS? Um, we, we will always consider these things. We, we took decisions you around... You seem quite reluctant to use your tax powers, though, don't you? Well, no, I'm not reluctant to use powers, but we, you've got to consider the impact of powers before you use them. So we decided not to raise the basic rate of income tax because that hits low- and middle-income people. We are going into a period where inflation is rising and there's real pressure on the cost of living. Uh, but real pressure in the NHS too, it needs more money, doesn't it? And we're putting, we've put £3 billion more into the health service uh, in the last few years and we've got plans to put another £2 billion in over the next few years. But we took a decision not to give a tax cut to people on the higher rate of income tax, which has happened south of the border. So we, that, and that creates extra revenue because of the way our finances work, that we are investing in public services. So, of course, we'll continue to look at these things. But I think one of the big issues over the next couple of years, and it's kicking in already, is going to be the pressure on household incomes as inflation because of the, partly because of the low value of the pound, it uh, goes up. Okay. So the, the, the public sector pay caps become a real issue, and okay. we've said we'll lift that cap quick because of, of that. Sorry to interrupt, sorry, really short time, but a quick couple of follow-ups on the NHS. Why are one in four GP surgeries short of a doctor? Well, we, again, we're increasing the numbers going into uh, medical training, and uh, we've got initiatives underway to try to get more medical students into general practice. Again, it's a bit like teaching. Scotland's not unique here in terms of struggling to attract people into certain areas. You've been in but we're, 10 years. Absolutely, and we've got more, we've got 12,000 more people working in the health service, and that includes more doctors, more nurses, more allied health professionals. But, you know, we, we have challenges, and I'm not going to sit here and say okay. we don't. Some of those are not unique to Scotland, but we're determined to make sure 
we get on top of them. I need to draw this to a close because we're at the end of our half hour and I guess you need to get home to watch Theresa May and Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn on the, the television. Must and, I? And, well, you, a preparation for your own appearance. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much indeed for being here, for your contributions. Thanks to Nicola Sturgeon. That's the end of Ask the Leaders. Enjoy your Friday evening.